much welcome everyone who's here and everyone who's online. We're super happy that you're joining us. Um, if this is your first time here, we have red bags for you. Um, they look like this and the ushers will hand you one. Um, so if you wanna raise your hand, they'll bring you one. And then inside is information about the church and um, a red card. If you fill it out, um, we just wanna get to know you. Um, you'll, once you fill it out, if you go to the hub in the back, we have a gift for you. Um, if you fill it out online, they'll send you a gift through the mail. Um, and then also if you already attend here, but maybe your address has changed since you filled out a red card, if you fill out a white card, um, we just wanna update your information. That way we're able to send you stuff. Um, but yeah, so that's that. Um, I just wanted to share with you guys um, something that has been on my mind. Um, this week's Thanksgiving, and um, I was thinking about it earlier, like, oh, what do I share? Like, just asking God, like, I don't really know what, what do you want me to share? And this verse came to mind. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 says, Always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And it, I've been thinking a lot lately, just like, it's so easy to think about 2020 as being like a terrible year, because it's it hasn't been easy for anyone. Um, and I know, like, it hasn't been easy for me. Um, and it's so easy to just look at all the bad and the negative, and if we're focusing on that, like that's all we're gonna think, and that becomes like our mindset. And um, I just really felt like God wanted me to share with you guys to like, to think of things to be thankful for. There is something that you can be thankful for, whether it's your family, whether it's food, whether it is the house that you have lived in because you were stuck in quarantine, like there's something to be thankful for. And if we focus our mind on that, that's gonna bring us out of whatever thoughts that we've been in um, that are that are not good like that's the only way we're going to get out of those bad thoughts and like you know 2020 is just a year um it's a mindset like we get to choose whether to be happy or we get to choose um to be thankful so i just encourage you guys as we go into worship and also this week to choose things to be thankful for also reach out to people like we don't know what people are going through um and yeah, let's go into worship.
sing for all that you've done for me.
of the goodness of God all my life. Your glory, God, is what 
like me that have cordoned off places in their hearts and places in their lives where they just won't allow God to go. And I just ask that if you know that that's you, if you know that there are areas that you've just set apart from his glory and his power, that you surrender those things. It is not worth holding on to. It is not worth doing it alone. Welcome him into it. Give him the power to move in our lives. God, we are grateful for your goodness and we know that it has been there all along. We just have to change our perspective and become aware of you and accept you and surrender to you.
Lord Jesus, there is none but you. Lord, we praise you, we lift you up, we glorify you. We thank you, God. You are so great, you are so powerful. You are so worthy to be praised, God. We can't say that enough. And Lord, you're coming soon. And I, for one, cannot wait for that. Lord, I pray for our church today, this morning. Lord, would you please fill us with encouragement? Would you please bring comfort? Would you bring peace? assurance, Lord, of your sovereignty, that everything is in your hands, Lord, and your will is going to be accomplished. It is being accomplished right now, God. There is nothing happening that surprises you. Lord, we are so grateful that we get to serve such an amazing God. Lord, would you please soften our hearts and accomplish your work in us, Lord, that we would hear your word, that we would receive it, that we would obey it. Thank you for your great love and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, City Church. Good morning. Trust you're all doing well. Um, before we get into it, I'll just remind you that we're not really passing an offering plate around right now for obvious reasons, but if you'd like to give today your tithes and offering, we have a basket set up at our back table back there so you can continue to do that. And then if you're watching online, which I trust many of you are, um, we have different ways for you to be able to give as well. Whether it's text to give, which is my personal favorite, I use that all the time now, or there's uh, our website, you can give through that page, or however, there's, there's many ways to do it. The important thing is just do it. Right, so, anyway. Anyhow, yeah, because God loves a cheerful giver. So, yes. Uh, and then I want to thank everyone who has um, reached out to us. I know a lot of people were concerned about us because, because we had coronavirus. Oh my goodness, we did. Some people are still a little bit afraid to be around us, but we're better. Okay, praise the Lord, we're better. We got through it relatively unscathed and... Um, and we are better, so I thank the Lord for that. Um, it's his fault. Okay, it's so, yeah, <laughs> it's my fault. It's all these people I wanna be around all the time. But, um, yeah, so um, anyhow, I, you know, I'm grateful that for us, it was, um, it was not that extreme, you know, and I know that for some people it has been, but for us it wasn't. And um, I suppose the severest um, symptom of having COVID is losing your taste, right? Your taste and smell, yeah. Well, I didn't include smell in that because sometimes that's a benefit. That's true. You know, there's times where, you know, there's times where it's okay. It's okay to lose your smell. You know, it's even a bonus. It's a plus. But, um, you know, losing your taste for sure is horrible. And I guess somehow those things are connected. Yeah. So it is it is really weird when it happens because you don't even know it's happening. It's just all of a sudden you can't smell anything anymore. Everything just smells like like air. There's nothing. And everything you drink just doesn't matter what it is. It just kind of comes across as water. and uh, But it comes back. So I would say that was the most... Um, 
kind of annoying of the symptoms, but we're better. And I'm not really wanting to spend a lot of time talking about that. I just know that a lot of people were concerned about it and um, we're doing good, we're doing well. So thank you for everybody who reached out. They offered to go shopping for us and all that stuff, but, but we made it, we're doing good. So a lot of DoorDash, right? A lot of leave it at the door. So praise the Lord for DoorDash. You know, you can get Red Robin or anything you want. So it's a pretty good deal. So a couple of weeks ago, I come out at about 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning into my living room. And, um, and I find Tori there studying her Bible, which is pretty typical, right? That's about every single morning is when I find that happening. And and she said, um, God is just kind of downloading this word to me right now. And I said, well, then let's teach it together. And of course, the schedule has been a little bit weird lately with us getting sick. I was, I've been out of this particular pulpit for two weeks. The first week, I didn't really realize until Saturday night that I wouldn't be here. So at um, six o'clock in the morning, I recorded my sermon and streamed that. And then last week, we already had Jack lined up to preach, but I didn't really want to be away from speaking to the church for more than two weeks in a row. So I told her at the time, I said, why don't you share that message? But then I asked her a few days ago, I said, how about I tag along with you on that one, right? So um, it's a good chance for us because I just finished going through the Gospel of John. So we finished that. And um, next week, I'm going to be starting through the book of Revelation. So we're gonna, we're gonna do that. And I'm seriously looking forward to getting into that. And, um, and so I thought, well, this would be a good time to just do this. God gave her a, um, it's a word about marriage, but I would encourage you that if you're single right now, do not check out because this is really, this is a message about relationships. And it is also, um, to me too, it's it's just about as equally a message on stewardship. So, um, so Tori, I'm super thankful that God has um, given you to me, and um, and I know that it's not always um, it's not always super easy being a pastor's wife. It's also not always easy being my wife, right? But um, God has given no yeah, I love God you. has given you much wisdom, and um, and I'm thankful for you. So um, let me just pray for this time, and then you can start us off, and then I'll just interrupt you sometimes because that's just what I do. Can I interrupt you real quick? Sure. You pray? Absolutely. Did you want to update on something? Oh, it's kind of changing gears, but then get back, and that's yeah, kind of like my yeah, day. sure. Yeah, so we did deliver the dinners to Pace Academy, and that went wonderful. So thank you for everyone who contributed dinners to Pace Academy. Every single kid in the school got a full Thanksgiving dinner to take home to their families, and we delivered all those on Friday. So we will have pictures up for you on Facebook soon that'll show um, you know the, the packages being delivered to kids' rooms and... and um, you know, because of COVID, they didn't want a lot of people on campus this time. So it was just Tori and Jackie and I that delivered them on Friday, but so many people contributed. So thank you for that. And we'll have pictures to share with you soon about how that went. So now can I pray? Yeah. All right. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this church. I thank you, God, for my wife, Lord. I thank you for the wisdom that you've that as she put, Lord, you have downloaded into her concerning the marriage relationship, Lord, and just really concerning relationships in general. So God, I pray that you would anoint her, that you would use her, God, and that, Lord, this, this message today, this word, that it would bring healing, God, to our hearts, Lord, that it would give us encouragement about the relationships that we are in. So I thank you for this, Jesus. We are so grateful, God. We are grateful, God, for your protection and your provision. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so like he said, since it is a 
a lot about marriage, but it is also a lot. You could apply this to your coworkers or family or just relationships in general. So yeah, please never check out. The Holy Spirit's gonna keep you awake. Um, so as you guys know by now, I do like to use a lot of scripture and I had to cut some out, but if you guys just have your thumbs ready, if you're one of those typers and you can type the scriptural references or if you have an old fashioned pen, um, you can just write it down. I totally forgot to give these to Jeremiah this morning. Okay, um, so we'll park in some and I'll reference others so you don't have to like be quick to changing to all of these either. So just for a quick history's sake, um, in Genesis 126, it says, let us make man in our image, which is a reference to the Trinity. And then also in Genesis chapter 2, if you want to turn there, you can. I'm going to read a couple scriptures or passages. Starting in verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help me. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help me for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, whoa, man, just kidding. He didn't say that. This is, he said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So Mark verse 24, just in your mind, that I'm going to come back to it again. I'll ref reference it again. And so in verse 20, it says, though, help meet. And a lot of translations want to call it help mate, but that's not the translation. It's help meet is the real word. And it says a help meet was not found. So the Hebrew word for help meet is ezer konegdo. I'm probably saying that correct, too, yeah. just so you know. Yeah. Very good. We're all scholars here. We all know oh, Hebrew. Yeah. Okay, Ezer means aid or help. In other places in the Old Testament, refer to either it refers to either God or military allies. So, adding konegdo modifies the meaning to one who is the same as the other, or who surrounds, protects, aids, helps, and supports. This is what God was looking for for Adam. Um, the word Ezer is used twice in the Old Testament for, to refer to the female and 14 times to God. So, for example, in the Psalms, I think it's Psalm 23, when David said, the Lord is my helper, he says, the Lord is my Ezer. In Genesis 4, so we're still in Genesis, the history lesson here. In Genesis 4, we see that um, God created the family unit with Adam and Eve, and then Cain and Abel came along. And then in Deuteronomy 6, jumping to there, you don't have to turn there, but if you want to make note of it, Deuteronomy 6, um, again, he references himself as the Trinity. And then in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, God tells the Israelites to teach the ways of the Lord to their children, to remember how he brought them up out of Egypt, and do not forget what he has done and how he did it. And it's just reiterated over and over to your kids. Um, so again, in Deuteronomy, he re reiterates the family unit. So I just want to establish in our minds or bring to remembrance to your mind of the Trinity and how the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all working together. But they're separate. Oh, I'm so sorry, honey. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to come back to this unity point a little later in the message. It's hard one handed. I know. I wrote, Let's share. No, no, I wrote more notes. So you said not to, but I'm like, I'm writing more notes. <laughs> Okay, so stay with me because I'm going to take that, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that unity, they work together into marriage and unity. So if you could turn to Ephesians chapter 5, 
Jeremiah, I know how you're quick. Sometimes if you want to do the whole thing on there, 21 all the way down to 33 for those at home, if they need it, you don't have to. But we're going to stay uh, parked in this one for just a bit. So Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 21. It says, And further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives submit to your husbands in everything. From some of these passages, you can liken them to the unity of the Trinity, submitting to one another. But not one person, I'm going to put lording, quote unquote, lording over another. But ultimately, you know, the Father God, the Father has a plan. And the Holy Spirit and, the, uh, and Jesus work together to fulfill that. So wives, it says, submit to your own husbands. We really need, um, we women really have to work on that independent spirit that we have and disunity sometimes in things with our husbands. There needs to be more honoring with our lips and our actions and especially in the home. When Jesus asks you to do something, women, how do you respond to Jesus? Do you snap at Jesus? Jesus asked you to do something, do you just snap at him? Do you ignore Jesus when he asks you to do something? Uh, do you say you're gonna do it, but you do it, you don't do it? Yeah, I'll take care of that, honey. Or you don't say to the Lord, maybe you say that to the Lord, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'll take care of that, but you don't do it. But then just compare that to how you respond to your husband. Yeah, I'll do it, and then you forget about it. Why did you forget? Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that. Um, how is your relationship and your response with, to Christ? I hope that you can see that I'm just trying to draw a line here of um, check your responses to Christ. We want to have good responses to Christ. And check your response to your husband. Of course, if your husband isn't asking you to, to sin in something, we can respond better. I believe that this, this could go both ways, but I'm specifically addressing women right now. Men will be addressed later in Ephesians. So ladies, how you respond to Christ is a good way to respond to your husband. So if you're having a hard time doing that, are, what I mean is, are you loving your husband when he asks you to do something? Um, do you have a good attitude? So kind of like we just have an ongoing relationship or conversation with Christ. At least I try to. And I re hopefully I respond good to him. I just need to. Want, I want to be Christ-like, right? And try to transfer that to the responses to my husband. Now, if your husband isn't doing what he's supposed to be doing, you be the judge of what he's supposed to be doing, I guess. But um, it makes it more challenging, but it doesn't mean that you are off the hook in how you respond to him. Whether you think he deserves it or not, um, and you can, again, apply this to your relationships at work with your boss, um, with your friends, with your kids, with coworkers, you respond in Christ-likeness. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, yeah. The thing I wanted to talk about right there, thanks for giving me a moment here, Tori, in this, was, um, you know, from from my perspective, from a husband's perspective, and something I would like to encourage um, really everybody in, but Tori, she is a wonderful, submissive wife, but I always remember that submission is a gift. And I hope I can communicate this to you as, as like, as impactful as this is for our marriage. Submission is never something that I could have won from her in an argument. Um, believe me, <laughs> it would be impossible in our relationship for us because neither one of us have any kind of um, weakness in that area that, that would back down from a fight. I hope that makes sense, but it would just escalate and escalate and escalate, right, in matching aggression until it just went, you know, I know there's no end to that. So submission is a gift. 
And um, it, doesn't, it doesn't indicate value, it indicates design and what God has done. And then also like this term, help me, and how she shared that it is a term referred to as the Lord. I would also point out to you that the Holy Spirit is referred to as a helper as well. And we looked at that word a number of weeks ago, probably three, four weeks ago, that word paraclete, right? That means to come alongside and give traction to. And I was just thinking about this as I was going through your notes and preparing that, that going back to Genesis, what you read there, how when man was in that deep sleep, the Lord took a rib from him. And I do think there is some significance in the location of what God chose from the man, right? And that he took it from his side, okay? And what is the role of the Holy Spirit? He comes alongside us, that para alongside of, cleat, giving traction to, helping, guarding, protecting. And I just want to make sure that, you know, in this teaching that ladies, you recognize the significance and the impact of what God has given you to do. And really the most, the most accurate um, comparison is that of the Holy Spirit, you know, surrounding, protecting, caring for. So, um, so there is tremendous value into that. And I would just tell you that um, help and even submission are given because of grace, not because of merit. So, um, so if you're ever fortunate enough to be in any relationship, whether it's in the workplace even, as far as like an employee, employer relationship or, or in a marriage, if you're ever in a place where you are fortunate enough to experience that kind of submission, please never get arrogant about it because it's only by grace that you have been given that opportunity. It's nothing that you necessarily merited, right? It's not, you know, it's not because, like in our marriage, it's not because I'm such a good leader or such a good husband or anything. I try to be, I try to be, but it's not that. It's because Tori chose to bring that into our marriage. And really, she was the source of a lot of healing in our marriage then, too. And then that submission, of course, in a marriage relationship, what it does then, even from a husband perspective, is then it challenges you to be better, you know? Yeah, so off notes and just a little back history, it was probably around nine years of marriage when we were at our nine-year mark. We've been married over 23 years now, but at nine years, I mean, I kept reading 2 Timothy, and I'm like, Lord, I don't know how to do this, and I don't know how to be a good wife. I don't know how to do all this stuff. So we'll get into this message, too, about the body. He uses the body. We're, like, joined together, and we need each other. And so I got a book. I didn't understand. I was reading the Bible. It's not like I wasn't reading my Bible, but I didn't know how to apply what I'm reading. I didn't grow up in a Christian home, so or was it modeled for me very much? So I got a book, and this book was a help. And at nine years of marriage, you know, she just got into my business and I wanted to throw the book and all this stuff, but I pushed through <laughs> and it has gotten better since then. We weren't on the verge of divorce. I was just tired of like, what is going on? What am I doing? So No, I would agree with you. We were not on the verge of divorce, no, I just... but I think in our mindset, um, we were on the verge of just settling for having an unhappy marriage. And I think we were at that kind of impasse. Divorce was never an option for us. It's just not. We've, we've experienced it too much growing up in our family. So we both knew that that wasn't something that was, that wasn't an option for us, but we were not happy in our marriage. And I just, I remember not to, if we need to shorten other stuff up, we can, but I just, I remember, um, you didn't tell me you were reading that book. You didn't, and things just changed, right? But I didn't know why. I didn't know why. So I would like go to argue with her and she wouldn't argue. And then it's like, wait a minute, 
That's not how we do things, right? We're supposed to be fighting right now. What is going on? You know, and it's like, oh, she just let me have my way. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is, this is not right. And then you have to think about how you're behaving because all of a sudden you feel like a bully, right? So then you got to, okay, I got to start doing things differently. Um, even in our romantic life, things improved greatly, right? Like our whole marriage got better. You can talk about any of that. No, I'm not going okay. to. And, but the reason, the reason I share some of that stuff with you is I don't know how far it was, maybe a year or two later, but you taught that as a study to a group of women in our church. And I had husbands coming up and like shaking my hand <laughs> for like months. They'd just come up and they'd say like, I don't know what your wife said to my wife, but thank you. <laughs> and I know it literally saved three marriages, us going through yes, that book. There was did. people on the verge of divorce it and did. it saved marriages. The book is called Created to Be His Helping. Don't agree just, with everything in we it. We don't. But we there's don't. stuff in it. Yeah, it's just okay, like all of these books written by authors, you chew up the meat, you spit out the bones. Yeah. Right? So, you know, go through it prayerfully. But And I've learned are, so much since then. There's so many other resources yeah. out there, too. But that was a real turning point for us, for sure. It was. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, women, just real quick, when's the last time, women, that you looked at your husband and smiled at him? and just was like happy with your husband. Just think on that. Okay, all right, moving on to verse 25 in Ephesians. Husband, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or without blemish, but holy and blameless, so in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed it and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united with his wife. And the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I like how he is pointing, uh, Paul, this is Paul writing Ephesians, I like how he is pointing and drawing lines all the way back in Genesis. I gave you that little history there, that the two shall become one flesh. And then it says in verse 32, this is a great mystery concerning Christ and the church. And just a real quick thing. I know I shouldn't go off my notes. But if men and women were to have a list, number one up here for man, maybe one or two, is respect. Whereas women's is like down here, we want respect. But it's not our priority. Our number one is like security. So if that's just something you can remember. And Christ, God says it here. The wife must respect her husband. That's something that we have to work on, especially if he mentioned it to us, we have to do it. Well, you started it going off notes. So I would just say to that, that, um, you know, the tendency that we all have in every relationship is we try to minister or we try to give people what they need based on what we need, right? So, you know, we think, well, if I need this, they must need that too. And that's what we try to do for them. So, um, you know, you know, like sometimes, um, like in Tori and I's relationship, I'm much more um, like, oh, what would the word be? Because you are very affectionate, but I'm more like, you know, kind of touchy feely affectionate, like big hugs or whatever. And Tori, by, by, yeah, but by nature, she is not, all of you who know her know that by nature, Tori is not, just, it's okay. She is not a touchy feely person. How many of you know that to be true? Okay, see, we know that. Tori is not a, she is not a touchy feely person. So, you know, if I see her having a hard time and I just walk up to her and go to give her some five minute long hug, you know, to help. Well, that's because that's probably what would do a lot of good for me. 
but she's probably standing there for five minutes going like, when is this going to be over? You know, and not in a, not in a way because she, it's just not her thing. But if I could go in and do something for her then, if I could take a task off of her, if I could serve her in some way, or if I could say, why don't you go to Ross, or why don't you, you know, get out of the house. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So you have to, we tend to do that though. We tend to give people what we would need in all our relationships, when really we need to learn how to recognize what their needs are and then do what's even counterintuitive for us and minister to those needs. Okay. I was going to say something and I forgot. It's probably not important. It's about, I don't know. Okay. So I just remember <laughs> telling the kids, the youth kids one time, I'm not one of those people who walks into the room and says, who needs a hug from me? That's not me. But there are people who are like that. And that's great. That's just not what I do when I walk into a room. But you know who you are who do that. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> you make me uncomfortable. I'm not sure what that means, but you know you who you are. You make me uncomfortable. And I'm just kidding. I really had to. I really had to. I have to push myself to give hugs. And I like hugs. I'm a hugger. COVID, whatever. I like hugs. <laughs> Still a I, hugger. I still am a hugger, though. Okay, so what does that mean, going back, the two shall become one flesh? Man and woman, it sounds to me like a marriage. Two separate bodies becoming one and two separate lives yeah. becoming one. It's the live thing. Though that scripture was on our wedding invitations, and I thought I understood it then over 23 years later, I think I know what it means more so now. Um, so then as it pertains to Christ and the body, the church, they become one. Christ and the bride, the church, become one. Which is it? Is, are you the body or are you the bride? And the answer is yes. We are both body and we will be the bride someday. In verse 27 it says that he might present her a sanctified, cleansed, washed with water, and by the word kind of church, to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. It sounds like the way that Christ feels about the church, that's you guys, that's your neighbors who are Christians and your other Christian friends, the church. It sounds like how he feels about you and how he thinks about um, the church. Let the husbands think about their wives that way. And I would say this here that too, that it could go, um, in the direction the women for the men how woman how are you feeling about your husband if she put more um wait let's see it's really good for you to um think about your husband and look at him the way that christ looks at him you got to put yourself in that position god how do you see my husband and um you want to see that too so if she puts more effort, though, into respect and honor, whether she thinks he deserves it or not, it is what Christ just asked us to do back up in verse 33. Okay, another scripture you could turn to is 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 6. Yeah, that whether, whether you think they deserve it or not is a critical part there because that is the difference between covenant and contract. Marriage is a covenant that says, this is how I'm going to be towards you no matter what, right? Whereas a, contra a contract, like if you have a contractual thinking about marriage, you're like, well, this person did this to me, so I'm gonna do this back to them, you know? Or I didn't feel this appreciated, so I wanna appreciate them. And that's just this, that's not what marriage is, you know? So what, what you're talking about there is really like that covenant type thinking, that this is how I will be towards you, whether you really deserve it or not. You know? That's what God did with yeah. Adam and Eve back in Genesis. It was yeah. a covenant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, just 1 through 6. Um, this is Paul talking to the Corinthian church. He says, I hope you will put up with me for a little more of my foolishness. Please bear with me, for I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. But I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted, just as Eve was deceived, or it says beguiled, by the cunning ways of the serpent. You happily put up with what 
every, with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. But I don't consider myself inferior in any way to these super apostles. I like how he said that. I don't know why. Um, who teach such things. I may be unskilled as a speaker, but I'm not lacking in knowledge. We have made this clear to you in every possible way. So to me, when I read that, it sounds like Paul is a little bit ticked off at the church right now in Corinth. Um, he was upset with the church body because he wanted to present it to Christ someday as a chaste virgin, it says in the King James. And so as I was thinking about this presenting that Paul will do someday, um, I remembered when Chris and I were dating and wondered how he felt introducing me to his mom and family at the time. I just said that weird, but that's not what I meant. Um, it sounded right. Okay. Introducing me to his mom and family. I felt great. Okay. Uh, get off my notes. Okay, so I remember that day having lunch with his family, and we were probably a month or two into dating. And I re also remember Aunt Jan stuffed bell peppers. Just That's what I remember that day. <laughs> it was good. Anyways, that's sort of what Paul is saying here when he wanted to, he's going to, he said, I wanted to present you. It's sort of what he's saying. Um, I'm going to present you to Christ someday. So what about Chris and I, when we're married for 50 plus more years or we're in heaven, that'll be like 70 plus years of marriage. We can do it. Delicious. Unless he comes and gets us first. So um, is Chris going to present me, his wife, to Christ? Some of that Ephesians uh, 5.25 for husbands, it says, for husbands, this means love your wife just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the clean, cleansing of God's word. Will you husbands say to Christ someday, here is the wife you gave me, Lord. I cleansed her with the word. I washed her by the word. I gave her some yeah. good encouragement. Yeah, and, and this is where I would point out that every analogy, especially when it's analogy, an analogy between like Jesus and us, every analogy has its limit, right? So when... When you're talking about husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church, I can't be, obviously, Jesus for my wife, nor does she need me to be. Like, I can't actually wash her with the word and sanctify her, right? But in the same way that Jesus is doing that for the church, there is something to be said for the words that I speak to my wife and the things that I do for my wife. Right. And um, and I I will never in like I said, I can't ever be Jesus to her. I don't own my wife. Right. Jesus owns all of us. We have all been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. So it's not even an ownership thing here. That's why I said, like, analogies can only go so far. But what I would compare it to is more of an issue of stewardship where God has trusted me with someone very precious. And this could go for every relationship in my life, with my children, with my friends, with my church, with people that I've worked with, all of those examples. God has trusted me with, with people who are extremely special and valuable to him. How am I stewarding over their lives? Am I doing things like that word in there is nourish, you know, you know, loving her as I love my own body and how I would nourish my own body? Am I doing things that, yes, provide for her physical needs and food and all of those things? But am I doing things, too, that help ensure that she's growing in every area of her life? Am I supporting her in her calling? Am I supporting her in her relationship with Jesus, with her, you know? So it's, it's all of those things. So um, it's, it's not that I can be Jesus for her, but I can certainly be doing everything I can to invest in her, right? And, and my words, even though I can't, I can't wash her with my words, I can't save her with my words, but I can edify her. I can strengthen her with my words. I can build her up. Or vice versa, I could also tear her down. Right. We get into that later. Yeah, I'm having absolutely. like I imagery of a plant. Like you can 
tend to plant and care for a plant. Okay, and so again, just what I mean by that statement of the husband presenting his wife before the Lord someday, I mean, uh, as the spiritual leader and the head of the household, he nourished her, he cherished her, he didn't like give in to her vanity all the time either. He saw her well-being, he did not neglect her, and he did his best to care for her with the same kind of care that Jesus would care for her. So hopefully that gives, if you're not doing that, that gives us a new perspective of how we should look at our husbands and our wives. So in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul is speaking about the Corinthian church. He wants to present that church to Christ. What is my husband going to present to Christ on that day with this body, city church, what he's pastoring over? Um, in verse 3, Paul warns the church body against being beguiled or deceived by Satan like Eve was in the garden. And so again, beguiled means deluded, imposed on, misled by craft, eluded by stratagem. In verse four, he asks, and this is me paraphrasing, he said, who in this world are you listening to? What people are preaching another gospel to you? What kind of spirit are they coming at you with? Who are you letting in out there from this world? Who are you taking direction from? And it reminds me of a sermon a few weeks ago about in front of Pilate. He's like, what is truth? And you got to have critical thinking of what you're taking in from this world right now. If it happens to Paul, in a short 14-year span, he got saved on the Damascus Road, and then he's pastoring or missionary this Corinthian church. It's about 14 years later, I think. If it could happen, and he warns them against it in 14 years, for us, it's over 2,000 years later. What is that saying to the church? He says, I fear that you're being beguiled like Eve. It makes me think that the church can be beguiled. You can get beguiled regarding marriage. You can have some bad ideas about marriage. Um, you get these weird ideas. Well, that's how my dad did it, so I'm going to do it. Or that's how my mom's doing it. I'm going to do it like her. And you draw these lines in the sand, and you're like, I'm not going to do this in marriage. But what really we should do, that could be a stronghold, too. You could have the wrong idea, even when you make, you can have good stands and bad stands. But it could become a stronghold in your mind. Um, instead, we need to let the Spirit lead you, right? Your marriage should be blossoming. Um, that means you can get beguiled in raising children. There's so many books out there on how to raise children, um, you can be beguiled in modesty. I'm very sick of uh, Hollywood's frame of modesty or the catwalk, whatever, in New York. Um, what is that called out there? Misled. They, people are being misled in modesty. That's not what the Bible says about modesty. You've got to read your Bible. Um, you could be misled in bitterness. And so I'm not going to get into the story today, but I've been on like a journey it's been like very gradual. I sunk into bitterness for like two years now. I got set free, praise the Lord, about two months ago. I felt freedom in it. And I don't know what this bitterness was and where it came from. And I'll save that for another day. But you can be beguiled by bitterness. You don't want bitterness. You can be beguiled by pride. You can be beguiled or misled by falsehoods and deceitful workers. Um, I don't know any personal, personally some deceitful workers right now, but I know they're out there. And when Chris and I were just starting off in ministry, um, he had a great uncle, Bill. He was so awesome. He was like 90 something years old and they invited us over for lunch one day after church. And they had done years and years of ministry and pastoring. And he just leaned into Chris and I and he said, he just did this and he's all one of these days. Are you going to come across some, some rats? What did he say? I wrote it down. Sorry. He said, you're going to come across some rats. Just feed them a little cheese. And I'm like, that is so funny. Yeah. We're going to come across some rats. Just feed them a little cheese. You're going to be okay. Feed them a little cheese. The way he said it. He was 90-something cool. years old. Nice and easy, grew up yeah. in the Great Depression, was he? Yeah. He was, was awesome. Funny. Super yeah. funny. So, um... I just have to say that we are richly here, blessed here at City Church. And when my husband and I were younger, he started pastoring around 26. And everybody's just like, whoa, he's got so much wisdom. I'm like, I know, he's got so much wisdom at 26. Like, you hear people not going into And then it just stopped right there. 26 was like the high point. <laughs> That's when he started pastoring. We were youth pastors yeah, before that. that was but it. Um, just 
flat line down. He rightly divides the word correctly. So we are blessed here at City Church because um, there are so many out there that you're going to get info from who could beguile you and they're talking and they're walking in their flesh and vanity. They have their idols and they want people to help serve their idols out. It's another story. Okay, so we want to make sure that we're not beguiled. So as Paul gets to the present, um, sorry, as Paul gets to present the Corinthian church to Christ and so many others that he touched, as my husband gets to present me to Christ and he gets to present City Church and Faith Fellowship, our old church, um, our old youth group when he was youth pastoring, it would seem like I get to present my husband to Christ someday in that this, this marriage, this husband is a gift that God gave me. I also be able to present my kids Maybe some people at City Church, maybe some people from Faith Fellowship or just men and women or children that I've poured into. So people are what matters. So what are you, me, what are you going to present on that day? In Matthew 25, this is the parable of the um, talents, starting in verse 14 through verse 20. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. He who called his own servants and delivered them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that received the five talents went and traded the same and made them five other talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid the Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of... Those servants cometh and reckoneth with them, so that, and so he that had received the five talents came and brought another five, saying, Lord, thou delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents. And so he, God, it has something to say to each servant, if you continue with the um, chapter. But what I would like to take away from this is that the talents could be people that God has in your life right now. The Lord expects a return from you. What gifts and talents has the Lord given you? I'm not talking about, yeah, I'm talking about people, not our other gifts and talents, but in this case, people. I want to state and um, that those talents are your husbands, your wives, your family, your kids, our church body here. And I want to try to connect with how we treat people with what we're going to present to him someday. Yeah, I think stewardship is like the key word to this message because there's sometimes even when you're sharing earlier about me, like what is my husband going to present City Church or my husband, it's it almost feels um, too amplified, like too amplifying of me in that situation. But it's not. It's it's what you're sharing, like in this stewardship role. Lord, you gave me this church to minister to. You know, here it is back, right? Here is this youth group. Here is my family. God, I've you know I've done my best with them. So it's it's when she's seen that, and it's not just an example for my life. It's an example for all of our lives. But that's the context of it. God, I have been a faithful steward over what you have trusted me with, you know? It's not, yeah, you know what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. So the Lord has given you words and people in your life for his glory, and what are you doing with them? Doesn't have to go to husbands and wives right here. Um, so now I know we all make mistakes with people and with our words, I'm not trying to condemn you, but hopefully I am trying to convict you. That is something that's supposed to happen here. Um, conviction is from the Holy Spirit. We should be convicted about what we say, how we say it, and who we say it to. Not only do I want you to be convicted in this area, I'm convicted in this area. I'm just bringing you what I sense the Lord, like Chris said, download into me while I'm still trying to work it out too in me. Uh, we do have a choice with our words. Uh, we do have control of our tongue. We like to say we don't have control of our tongue, but we do. Uh, we have to take responsibility. 
We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have the God who created language. And we have, uh, he lives inside of us, and we have the Bible. So just a real quick reference. You might want to look this up later. Matthew 12, verses 36 and 37, it says, But I say unto you, this is a parable, Matthew 12, 36 and 37, But I say unto you that every idle word that men will, shall speak, they shall give an account for it on, on the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. You can't get around that scripture. We have to be mindful of what we're saying. Um, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Meaning, if you love death, you're going to be speaking death. You're going to be speaking down to people. If you love life, you're going to be speaking life words to people. We will eat the fruit of it. So as a church, what are you doing with the words God has given you today? Day in and day out with the people that you have around you, the person sitting next to you at home on your couch, what are you speaking into their lives? Um, are you going to be able to present them to him one day? God, you've given me these four children, and I give them back to you plus what? What am I putting into my kids? You've given me this one person. I present them to you. There's a, lots of stories probably of friendships in the Bible, but between Jonathan and David, they had a great friendship. And what are you putting into people? What are you taking from people? Um, God, you've given me this husband. I've nourished him. I've watered him. I present him back to you. I cared for him with words. Um, I cared with him for love, with love. I have not neglected or buried things that you've entrusted to me. Um, so, of course, when you first meet your spouse, you aren't speaking death into them, right? Or else they'd say, get away from me. Kick rocks, dude. Get out of here. But you both were putting your best foot forward. You were like, oh, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to act a different way because I want my best foot forward in front of this person. And, of course, they're so love struck that um, they don't even see your flaws until you get married later. And you're like, oh, that's irritating. Why, did I, why didn't that bother me before? Because you were so struck with love. Um, you really were. At, at least... <laughs> At least you were trying, everybody was trying really hard when you were trying to get your now spouse. But we become complacent and we become lazy. What happens? Um, now that I got him, I'm going to show my true colors. I don't have to work on myself anymore. I don't have to tend this plant anymore. We might not think that way, but we act like that. We, Christ's servants, Christ's body, we need to tend to what God has given us right in front of us right now, all the time, and don't quit. And that reminded me, too, when I said that. I'm like, oh, yeah, he preached about uh, Peter casting his net out again. Don't be afraid to try it again. Don't be afraid to start smiling at your husband. Or husbands, don't be afraid to start smiling at your wives again. Make an effort to make this work. Um, when you know to do the right thing and don't, it makes you have a hard heart, and you don't want that. We want to be Christ-like. So there's lots of pictures throughout the Bible. You look in the Old Testament and you just see, to me, that there's just pictures upon pictures. So marriage is another picture that Christ of Christ and the church. God created and established marriage and the family back in Genesis. Government and the state of California did not give us marriage and they can't define it. In our marriages, words matter. Words are either death or life. And it always feels like, for me, I'm trying to get my mind and my heart and my mouth to align up. And just sometimes they don't align up. And I've struggled with aligning them. I know um, better than to just let my emotions rule. But I know also that God created emotions, and they are good, but they can't be ruling me. And I heard this um, statement recently, and it really hit home with me. He said, your heart is like the root in the tree, and your mouth is the fruit. So I've been trying to practice that. What's going on in my heart? My heart is the, the root and the tree, and I want good fruit to come out of my mouth. It is very convicting to me. Um, that is why we're supposed to be meditating on the word. Like the psalmist says, I believe it's Psalm 19, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. 
And in Philippians, it says, whatsoever things are lovely, noble, just, praiseworthy, praiseworthy, I'm paraphrasing this, think on these things. To me, it sounds like what we meditate on in our hearts and minds is going to come out of our mouths. We're going to speak um, some fruit, either death or life. And real quick, the last scripture is Isaiah 6, and it's really profound for me. Um, Isaiah 6, chapter, chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Jehovah of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is forgiven. So it took an act of God to the seraphim, flew across the room, grabbed some uh, coal with the tongs, and touched Isaiah's lips and purged his sins and iniquity. And it looks like Isaiah and the people in his community had a problem with their mouths, right? And it uh, so much that it was called iniquity and sin. And we know that we sin with our words. This definitely is a simplified version of marriage and Christ and our tongue all rolled into one message, but I hope that it spoke to you and it makes you want to study some more for yourselves. And hopefully you'll ponder these scriptures and how you um, are doing with your spouse, how you're doing with your kids. You can come on up, son. Uh, how you're doing with your friends and your, and your coworkers. Are we cultivating? Are we taking time to tend that ground, to tend our spouse? Are we getting some deep roots and rich soil? How do you do that? Ask the Lord. He'll help you how to do that. Are we stewarding well what he's giving to us? Are we speaking life and choosing life words over death words so that we can present to God someday? What are we going to do? What's one of the first things we're going to do in heaven? I don't know. We'll get to that in Revelation over the next few weeks, but this will be part of what's going to be happening in heaven. Um, will you guys see the Trinity working in unity, that's how your household is supposed to be, and that's how we're supposed to be getting along with people. There should be unity there. And I know it's going to be super quiet in your, it's probably quiet in your home right now if you're watching online or if we leave here. Nobody's going to want to talk. They'll be like, look, Tori said we're not doing right by our word. So it might be a little quiet and awkward on the drive home, but I think it's maybe something we just need to ponder. But I think it's a good thing that it's okay. Like this morning when Melina was leading, there was a little bit of a lull in our worship. And we wanted to sit there and be in his presence and be quiet. And like, what are you speaking, Lord? What are you doing to my heart? It's okay to be quiet. Yeah. Amen. All right. Do you want to pray or do you want me to pray? I want you to pray for us. Okay. So you want to bow your heads with me? God, we thank you that, um, God, that you are so mighty, that you are so big, and that you get down and you cut asunder between the bone and the marrow, God. You can discern our thoughts. You can discern our motives. God, and you speak right to those things that we need. If we only got one thing from this message today, God, it was from you, and that's what you want us to take and to work on. God, I thank you that the body of Christ is strong, Lord God. The body, this remnant that's left in these days, Lord God, is doing everything it can to be tightly fit together and joined and knitted together for your glory, God, and for your purposes. God, that people here would know that we are not alone and that we can be accountable to each other. It's okay. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to do things a different way than what we've done in the past. It's okay to let our pride fall down. We don't have to stay in pride. We don't have to stay in bitterness. Jesus, you came to set the captives free and there's the word warns us against being beguiled and just these little bad roots maybe that have tried to take place in our hearts and in our minds. But God, you want to set us free from that.
God, I pray for your church to walk in freedom, Lord God. In marriages, that they can continue to be a marriage that uh, people can look to in relationships that um, between coworkers, bosses, and friends, that it can be an edifying relationship that we can let our pride fall, that we can let just things go that aren't going to, um, they're just like a moot point, God, that we can rise above it and learn, if we're not doing it already, learn how to speak more life into people. God, I just thank you for, um, I'll just, I thank you for you doing a work in us. And I know you're not done with us, and I just pray that you would help us to, um, to guard our lips. I know there's proverbs about covering your mouth before you say something. God, it is something serious that you want us to be reminded of to hold your hand over your mouth so you don't say something. I remember biting my tongue. It really hurt to bite my tongue and not say something to people, to my husband or whoever, but God, um, help us to be led by you. And we just pray that this word gets inside of our hearts, gets inside of our minds, so that we can live it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Tori. God bless you, church.